This is Ogrodowski of WeAreChange.org, and today, of course, is September 11th, 2017. Today, we have a very special program for you guys. We have a very special guest that is a personal hero of mine whose valor and heroic actions saved countless of lives on September 11th, 2001. A story that you should hear about, but of course, you don't. This man, of course, is William Rodriguez, the last man out of the Twin Towers. We're joined with Willie today. And Willie, your story is incredible. Uh, Willie was working inside of the Twin Towers. He had the master key that unlocked the doors that was working with the firefighters. Willie didn't run away. He stayed in till the towers until he was the last person and had to dive underneath a fire truck. And what Willie saw contradicted the official story of 9-11. And it, I mean, there's so much to get into, Willie. But first of all, we're 16 years away. Do you want to share anything about just this anniversary and what you personally went through on 9-11? Well, 16 years ago, you, you said it right. It's been a long time. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, our wounds are still open. We're still hurting. Uh, we're still going through the process of uh, the traumatic uh, shock uh, syndrome, uh, PTSD. Um, um, you call me a hero, I call myself a survivor. For me, the heroes died on 9-11, in, in my opinion, because they died helping others. Uh, I, I just had the only tool available for me at that time to do great things. So I was, I'm a survivor. I have that uh, survivor's guilt. Uh, why did I survive and my friends didn't? And now 16 years after, it hits me stronger. Uh, because uh, I see the families, I see new families that came out from people that I uh, saved. And, and I always wonder, you know, what would have happened if those people that I lost, those 200 friends, will be, al will be alive today? And uh, it, it hits you, it hits you hard. So 16 years after, we're still dealing with um, uh, the backlash of uh, what happened on that day. 9-11 changed me. They changed the world. We all know that, but it changed me in more ways than I expected, uh, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually. And I have seen uh, many things uh, since 9-11 that has made me very angry in terms of uh, how 9-11 has been manipulated, used politically, uh, uh, controlled for many other reasons that we know what, what what they are. They were eliminating rights, left and right, with the excuse to help us be safe. Uh, they, everything is 9-11. So, you know, and being on two conflicts uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, uh, the politics of fear, which we see all the time, is based on 9-11. So while you, I used to live, uh, for all the millennials, uh, what I used to live before 9-11 was actually the freedom that we all talk about. Uh, we don't feel that we have that freedom anymore since 9-11. I, I personally don't feel it. Other people may disagree, but, you know, this is my opinion and uh, the opinion of many, actually. Uh, after, you know, creating the Patriot Act, the Worst Powers Act was uh, changed many times. And uh, uh, we have seen that the 16 years after, we still don't have all the answers about what happened on 9-11. Last year, only last year, we got the famous pages from uh, the 9-11 Commission that were basically secret, uh, talking about the Saudi uh, government involvement, uh, uh, basically unveiled. And uh, uh, you have seen what happened afterwards, that the families have sued the Saudi government uh, for being, well, nine, 19 hijackers and 17 of them were um, um, so, so, Saudi officials, uh, Saudi uh, citizens. So you see, uh, the, 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 the problem here is that uh, we have been uh, constantly, constantly uh, uh, reminded about that day for the victims, survivors, and family affected. I give you an example, you know, just... Uh, this week, the new Charlie Sheen movie about 9-11 came out, opening more uh, wounds. So uh, it, it never ends. For me, 9-11 is more than a symbol. It's, it, it means a metamorphosis, a change, a constant change. Um, 
on 9-11, uh, I, I, it was a beautiful day. Today is a beautiful day, just like uh, that day. Uh, but it was clear skies. I woke up late. I called my supervisor named Anthony Saltalamachia, and I say, Anthony, I'm not going to work. And Anthony was crazy. He was like, oh, you're crazy. You have to come to work. You have to make it here. Please don't do that. And is the reason that he said that was because I was the person in charge of uh, cleaning 110 flights of stairs every day. Imagine one person cleaning 110 floors. It, th that was my job. And, and nobody else wanted to do that. If I didn't go to work, they have to send somebody to do it. So they say, Rodriguez, job now! And they will punch out the car and leave. So it was a constant problem with that. <clears throat> Every time I took a day off, they, 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 they would have two people leaving. Because they didn't want to do the job. And uh, uh, so I, 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 he begged me. And I said, okay, I'll go, but you have to sign my card. Like I made it uh, a, a time that I went to work at time, so I don't lose any hours. And he said, don't worry, I'll sign the card. I said, okay, so you're going to sign it. I go. So I went to work, uh, and I got there at 8.30. I, I, I went straight to the um, uh, B1 level, the first uh, sub-level in the building. The building has six sub-levels. And uh, my company was American Building Maintenance, ABM. And uh, I was uh, in the office. There were 14 workers, new workers that were used to uh, uh, replace the people that were on vacation. Because in September, we get a lot of people that goes on vacation because of the kids or whatever. And uh, um, the supervisor and me, and we're talking about the distribution of work of that day. And we're talking about what you know, what was going on. I was very good friends with the supervisor, still are. Uh, uh, and uh, while we're talking at 846, we hear bang, an explosion very hard, very, very powerful that lift us up from the floor. Like, you know, you just shake us up. And the first thing that happens was that uh, the, 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 you know, the false ceiling fell, fell on top of us. The sprinkler system got activated. Water started going everywhere. There was crack everywhere. Uh, the fax machine fell on the floor, things like that. And uh, everybody's screaming because we didn't know what was happening. We didn't have any windows. We're in a basement. And uh, the screaming and, and the first thing that comes to my mind is that a generator blew out on the B2 level, the sub level be 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 below us. And that's where the mechanical room, they have all these machines and whatever. And I figured it was one of the machines that blew up. And uh, when I went to verbalize it seconds after, uh, 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 I, when I went to say, it's, it's probably a machine that blew up on the, on, on the mechanical room. When I went to say it, <laughs> another explosion. And uh, there the building shake very hard. And that it sounded coming all the way from the top. So, you know, I, I, I felt very strange about that. And because he shakes so much, he gave you a strange sensation because, you, and again, you didn't know what was going on. Again, we have no windows. And uh, through the hallway, a guy comes running, screaming, explosion, explosion, explosion. A guy named Felipe David, uh, Felipe David uh, in English, it was from Honduras. I did not know him. He worked for a company called Aramark, which was the vending supply company. And he was the guy in charge of, you know, putting sodas and uh, M&Ms and things like that in the machines around the building. And he was in this uh, closet on, on, on the basement. And he said that he, he was, uh, you know, filling up his supply cart and fire was all over through the door, you know, burning him. And, and, and anyway, when he comes through the hallway, screaming, uh, explosion, explosion, I see that something is hanging from both of his fingertips. And it looks like he was clogged. And as he got closer, we started screaming. Everybody started screaming because we realized it was his skin. His skin was pulled from under his armpits. It was peeled off on both arms. And, and I saw that I started screaming as well. And when... I said, what happened? What happened? And when he turned around, all this part was hanging the, the, of his face. And um, nobody wanted to touch him because this was in 2001. And you remember that on 2001, they had that uh, campaign of not touching anyone uh, with blood because of the AIDS scare. You know, everybody was scared about AIDS. 
And so nobody wanted to help me. So I took a box of uh, a cleaning towel. It was a cleaning company. So I started putting the, the, the towels around him, bandaging him. And the, that red shirt that he had, it wasn't because he was ready. It was because he was soaked in blood. 33% of his body was burned. How do I know it was 33%? Because afterwards, when he was in the hospital, you know, they did the, 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 the scale on him. And uh, so anyway, I, I said, don't move to the, to the burnt man. I'm going to call the uh, emergency medical unit that is located on the South Tower. And usually they were very, very, very effective to come to any type of emergency. So I went inside the office to pick up the phone to call the emergency uh, uh, office. And when I pick up the phone, when I touch the phone, we hear bah! another explosion. And there, the building shakes so much that it looks like it was, uh, it makes you feel that like, like it was an earthquake. Because everybody went inside the office under the door frames trying to protect themselves. My supervisor is screaming, it's a bomb, it's a bomb, it's a bomb. And, and again, you know, it's just he's acting uh, by reaction. Nobody knows what's, what it is because we don't know. We're on a, on a basement. And uh, I said, we got to get out of here. And nobody wanted to move. And nobody knew where to go. And I was there for 20 years. So I knew all the ins and outs, well, how to get through here. You know, I, I knew all the tricks. So I said, follow me. I know the best way to go. So, you know, this group follow me. I led them by, by helping Felipe David with the help of Kenny Johanneman. Kenny Johanneman was a co-worker, that uh, uh, friend of, of, of mine that worked in the company, that was helping me as well. And uh, uh, we, we started going out, and as uh, we go out, we made it outside the building. When we made it outside the building, an ambulance comes in, I stop the ambulance, I put Felipe inside, and that's when I hear for the first time, a plane hit the building, a plane hit the building. And it was the radio signal transmission coming from the security guard that led uh, uh, trucks with uh, deliveries going to the basement through the, through, 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 through the street level. And uh, <clears throat> as I, 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 I see this guy, I pick up the, the radio, I say, give me the radio, and he's in shock, he's looking up, everybody around the street is looking up. When I see uh, uh, the building from the point of view that I have, I look up, I see the hole, I saw the fire, I saw the smoke, and I saw debris falling. And what I thought it was debris, because later on I found out it was people jumping out of the building. But from the point of view that I had, I couldn't discern what it was falling. And as I saw that, I realized that the smoke was so dense that it covered the antenna of the building. You cannot see the antenna. And I said, oh my God, the people from Windows. And I started screaming, the people from Windows, we gotta go back. And I was talking about Windows of the World, the Windows of the World restaurant that was located on the 106th and the 107th floor. And at that moment, I realized I was alive because of a miracle. Because if I made it at eight o'clock, I always started cleaning the stairs from the top down and I always went to Windows of the World because they gave me breakfast. And I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerned that they were stuck in there. And I said, you know, we got to go back. We got to go back. Nobody wanted to go back. My supervisor, Anthony Santalamacchia, said, Willie, no, 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 stay here. Let's let's organize the people and let's do, uh, uh, um, how you call it, uh, um, um, a management of what's, got, what's happening over here. I said, no, no, we got to go back. We got to go back. And I said, forget you. It was a bad word, actually. I got to go back in. And I start running inside the building with the radio of the security guard. And I made it to the to the South Tower. You see, it? remember, the North Tower and the South Tower connected through the basement. I made it to what is called the OCC, or the Operation Control Center, which was the center that was placed to manage emergency uh since we had the attack of uh the the 27th of february of 1993 that killed six people and injured 1000 people on the same basement they put a bomb you know a, 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 a truck with bombs in it with uh, uh explosive and and uh so i figured that you know they were going to help me and i wanted to let them know that i have a person that was injured outside the building so when i go there that place was supposed to be manned 24-7. When I go there, there was nobody there. 
there were people there before because there were mm -hmm. transcripts, but I was hitting the window, pa, 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 with the radio, screaming, help, help, help. And nobody, nobody opened the, the doors. Everybody mm -hmm. was gone. And uh, at that moment, I see a guy who I knew named Jimmy Barrett. And Jimmy Barrett was on the subgrades of the South Tower. He didn't hear anything. He was like, you know, what's happening, Willie? What's going on? And I told him in seconds all that I went through, and, and he couldn't believe it. So that gives you an, a, a general idea how many people probably died on the subgrades of uh, the South Tower without ever knowing whatever happened. So he didn't know. He didn't hear anything. So I said, you got to get out. And when I said that, between the two towers, there was an employee entrance for the Marriott Hotel. And this security guard was the lady that signed them in. And I see her there. I said, what are you doing here? I, said, I went running. He said, what are you doing here? And she said something that changed me forever. She mm -hmm. said, I heard everything, but I cannot leave because I am a new employee and I don't want to get fired. But again, you know, we didn't know what was happening. She didn't know. I didn't know. You or everybody else watching this on television had better information than we did and not counting that the radios were failing. Everybody knows that the radios failed and the uh, transmission was not going through. There were, you got over, yeah, what, over a thousand people trying to use two frequencies. And uh, so I said, no, you got to get out. And I grab her and I take her out. And I, said, I do that. I go to the um, North Tower and I found a guy that worked for the recycling company who said, I hear scream, I hear screams. And uh, all you could hear was the sprinkler system, you know, the, the, there's water everywhere. And uh, I said, oh, my God, I cannot hear anything. So I put my ear on one of the freight elevators. Uh -huh. And what do I hear? Two people screaming, help, help, help. And uh, I screamed back. It was a freight elevator that went from the B6 to the B1. It didn't go to the upper floors. It, it was only those six flights, the six floors that it would go through. And uh, I started screaming, how many, of you, how, many, how many of you in there? And I hear back, there's two people here. There's two people. Are we going to drown? I said, what? I couldn't understand that. Look, when they tell you they're going to drown, the first thing is like, where is the water coming from? And it was, this is what happened. These two people, one guy that worked for the Port Authority as a painter, Salvatore Giambanco, and a guy that went to do a delivery with an envelope, they heard an explosion. They went inside the elevator to get out. The elevator started going up. They stuck. They went down and they lost power. And they got stuck between the B2 level and the B3 level stock. Imagine. And uh, all the water from the sprinkler system was going in. And I hear, we're going to drive. I just couldn't believe it. So we opened the door with the help of the, the recycling guy. And Jimmy Byer was still with me. We opened the door and we pried it open. The doors opened this way. And when the doors open this way, the bottom door, when it get to the level of my feet, all the water that was on my side went rushing in with more power. I went down and it looked like this. And I see two guys looking up, scared. Their eyes were basically in horror with water almost up to their bellies. And it was because the, and the reason that I could see them was because it was a freight elevator. And um, I said, no, 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 God, please, what, what can I do? And I didn't believe in anything at that time. At that time, I said, oh, God, please help me. And I remember that in the area where we have the garbage compactors for the building, the electricians always have different ladders, but they, you know, chain them up against a big uh, cement pillar that was there so people would not steal them. And I said, let me go and find one. And I start running there and guess what they were all chained except the longest one of all of them and i took that one and i went in and i dropped it inside the elevator and i went in and with the help of the other guy we we, we I, I i lifted the, the the gate from the elevator and i got these two people out and then with the help of jimmy and the recycling guy we brought them up and we take them outside the building once i put them outside the building inside an ambulance 
I went back to running again in, in, inside the building. And nobody was like, you know, what are you crazy? Don't go back, don't go back. So I went back and I didn't want to be stopped. And when I went back the last time, third time, I found a police officer from the Port Authority and he said to me, Will, do you have the key? And I said, yes, I have the key. And he said, uh, let's go. And he meant if I had the master key, there were five master keys in the building and on that day. And uh, the people with the other four were trained on egress, uh, search and rescue, first aid, all the things, you know, they were the big bosses. And they had the training from the Port Authority in case of an emergency, they ran away. I had the fifth key. And the reason that I have the fifth key was because in 1996, while I was mopping the floor of the uh, uh, stairwell, I went down a whole flight of stairwell because I slipped and I hurt my back. And I sued the Port Authority, a labor dispute, uh, for some uh, way to, to, to escape a, 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 a stairs uh, in case of an emergency. I asked for a radio and for the key. And they didn't want to give it to me. But because I worked from the 20 years I was in the building, 10 years I worked for Governor Mario Cuomo, I have what they call security clearance by the uh, uh, state police and the Port Authority police. So they had to give it to me, and they gave it to me. And uh, little did they know that that key was going to be a key factor on 9 11. And um, I made it to the lobby with the police officer, and the, uh, the firemen were waiting there for what they, it was called uh, the main elevator. And uh, the, the elevator was gone because when a uh, plane went in, but broke the wires, I don't know what happened. You know, the, the elevator had five people inside. It, it went f five flights down. The people broke their legs and, and their ankles. They were in the hospital. You, you can find videos uh, of it, uh, of my friends, because I knew them too. I knew the people that were in the elevator. So the officer said, you know, don't wait for the elevator. The elevator is gone. Follow him. He knows the best way to go up, and he has the master key. And that group of heroes, my real heroes, were the firemen. They start following me as we go up. And uh, what I remember was that it, they have so much equipment in their bag. I have no equipment. And, and you know, I'm desperate that they are not going at the same rate as I'm going. But I didn't understand that at that moment. Look, look, what I said to to, to, to me, uh, 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 to myself at that moment was like, why are these people not following me at the same rate? It was because I didn't think of all the equipment that they have and that I did the stairways, stairway, stairwells every day, every single day. So I was in a very physical condition than the firemen. So we are opening doors, we changed stairs. There were three stairwells, change a different stairwell, uh, <clears throat> start opening doors. The reason that that key was crucial, I mean, listen, they're firemen, they can break the doors. There were steel doors. It's the time that it takes to break every door. So when the plane went in, the impact was so powerful and whatever happened afterwards was so powerful that the oscillation made the door frames to become jammed. And that's why the key was so important. And so we started opening doors and getting people out. We screamed to people to follow my voice. Many floors I found people on the hallway because they were told that in emergency, they should all gather on the hallway and never take the elevator so that they were doing what they were told. So I told them to follow me, to, to show them the, the different areas and you know, and I kept doing that floor by floor, sometimes being above the firemen two and three floors. And uh, as I go opening doors and letting people out, I hear that there's a person on a wheelchair on the 27th floor. His name was Ed Baye. He was a paraplegic and uh, he has an asthma attack. And I don't know how to help a quadriplegic. I just don't know how to help a handicap. So I went to the uh, firemen and I said, there's a, you know, went down a couple of flights and I said, there's a man on a wheelchair uh, who has an asthma attack. What should I do? So don't worry, we're going to make it there. And to make it short, you know, through the whole process, we kept going up different doors and with different floors. We made it to the 27th floor. We made it to the 27th floor. I opened the door and that unit of heroes, they go in 
and they started to collapse one by one on the floor, one by one, because they were so tired. They have no more stamina. They have, they took their jackets off. Some of them took their boots off and they sat down on the corridor trying to get a second breath. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, those are my heroes. And uh, uh, the police officer said, Willie, do you know this floor? I said, yeah, I know it pretty well. He said, where can I get water? He said, well, on the opposite side, there's uh, vending machines with bottled water. He said, let's go. And I, I remember like a funny thing from 9-11 in the middle of the whole thing that he said that because I'm like concerned that I didn't have any money. He said, oh, I have no money. I'm looking for a change. I have no change. And when we get in front of the machine, the police officer started to break the machine with his boot. And I was like, oh, my God, you're breaking the law. I'm telling the, the cop, you know, I'm saying, I'm getting out of here. I'm the Puerto Rican. You are going to blame me for that. I'm not going to go for it. So I started, you know, kind of running away. I said, no, 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 please help me. And, and, and then I started taking trash cans. And we lift it up and fill it up with a bottle of water and gave it to the uh, fireman. I called my mother because I saw one fireman using the phone in the office area. I said, wow, there's still phone service. So let me call my mother. I called my mother in Puerto Rico, and she's screaming. What are you doing? I said, I'm, in, I'm, I'm on the tower. I said, oh, she's going crazy. What are you doing there? The building's on fire. I said, how does she know? I said, I didn't know that the whole world was watching this. And she's screaming at me to abandon the building. And I said, no, mommy, I'm helping these people in my ignorance. They don't know what they're doing. And uh, I'm going to help them up to a certain area, but don't worry about it. I'm not going to go to the danger zone. And she said, don't go to the fire. I said, I'm not going to the fire. And I was lying to my mother because I was trying to get to windows of the world. I was lying to her. So, and at the same time, I was getting calls on my radio from my supervisor. They had to abandon the building. Willie Rodriguez location. You can get the transcripts. The transcripts are available. And uh, they're calling me to abandon the building. I say, no, I'm with the fireman. I have the master key. I have to help them. And so I continue by myself because the firemen were on the floor, opening doors, letting people out, opening doors, letting people out, until I get to the 33rd floor. When I get to the 33rd floor, something strange. The floor is empty. But when I go around the corner, on the corridor, I found a lady trembling on the floor, you know, red dress, uh, American lady, blonde, no shoes. And I said, what are you doing here? And you reminded me the lady from the Marriott because she said, uh, uh, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, I'm a new uh, employee in the building. I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. Just, she didn't know. She had no training whatsoever. And uh, I grabbed her and I said, you got to go with me. I took her to the stairwell. There were two people coming from the cafeteria that was located on the 43rd floor. I said, Willie, do we help you? Can we help you? I said, yes, please take her away. And I see how they disappear with her down the stairwell. There was three stairwells, A, B, and C. B was the a wider one. And uh, I saw them going through the B stairwell. As I see them disappear, I go back on the 33rd floor and I went to what I call my office, which was a closet. I had a closet on the 33rd floor with many of my stuff that I use for cleaning. So I went to get a box of masks uh, to distribute to the people so they would not smell the acrid smoke that was in the area because there was a disgusting uh, uh, smells. And uh, as I went to pick up the box, what I hear on the 34th floor, the floor above me, I hear something like scratching the floor and it scared me. It scared me because I knew the floor was empty. I didn't know anybody was there. You know, they sent a crew to demolish the area. Uh, there was no walls, no nothing there. And uh, that's what I remember. And I used to hide there for lunch. So nobody would bother me because I could go there with a master key. You see, I, it, it, the, the elevator didn't open there. So when I hear that noise, I got scared. And it was the only floor that I did not open. I continue, now that I, you know, there was somebody that, you know, there, it comes a lot of conspiracy theories because of that. But, you know, I honestly don't know what, what was there. It was never investigated. So I bypassed that floor and uh, got up to the 39th floor. Uh, when I get to the 39th floor, the officer with me uh, came through another door 
uh, with two fire chiefs. They have those white shirts with uh, lines on their sleeves. So I knew they were, you know, they were big. And uh, as I get together with them in the middle of the corridor, we're talking about what we're going to do next when we hear <laughs> coming from the other tower or the other side. I, I don't know if it was that or the other side, it just because we have no window. And it was so powerful that in our building, we hear pa, 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 pa. And on the radio, we hear, we lost 65, we lost 65. I asked the officer, what does that mean? He said, the 65th floor went down internally, collapsed internally up to the 44th floor. And I said, oh my God, the people, the people from Windows. Now I'm really desperate. I gotta go up, I gotta, gotta go up. And he said, no, the area is blocked. You know, there was an internal collapse. And I said, I gotta go up. I said, no, Willie, you have done enough but you don't get paid for this. Better if you give me a hand with the man on the wheelchair on the 27th floor. And I got angry and said, you know, okay, I'll help you. I go to go to the, I'm gonna go to the 27th floor. I'm gonna get him out, but I'm coming right back. I said, okay, go. So I went to the 27th floor and I said, I have orders by the police officer to get this man down right now. And those firemen, as tired as they were, they stood up and said, we'll help you. And we started going down with FAA, and uh, we went down the, the stairwells. As we go down, we hear another huge boom. I think it was the collapse. I have no idea. Remember, I have no window, so this is a speculation. Uh, uh, I, it could have been the, the collapse of the South Tower, something. Or, 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 no, no idea what was going on. Uh, but it was so powerful that we lost balance. As we made it to the lobby, uh, all I see is destruction, totally destruction, uh, total destruction on the walls, the marble that was on the walls is gone. Uh, uh, when I look to the left, the area that was the mezzanine and the plaza and, and the shopping center area, that's all sunk in. There's dust everywhere. Uh, and I'm like in shock. And one of the officers said to me, one of the firemen said, Prepare the ambulance, prepare the ambulance. So I went to the front of the doors of, you know, the, the, of the lobby, uh, the main entrance door that faced the um, uh, West, West Side Highway uh, and the World Financial Center. As I went there to prepare the ambulance, I noticed that there was not a glass intact, nothing. And uh, the doors of the elevators of the lobby, they were like open from the bottom up like that. And I see that, I was like, what the heck is going on? And I'm in shock, and as I made it to the revolving doors, what was the revolving doors, the skeleton of the of the door, I noticed that the area uh, uh, across is, uh, it has a yellow uh, uh, crime scene uh, uh, tape, the one that they use by the police when there's a, a, a crime scene or an emergency, they say do not pass or whatever. And I see that, all around the area by almost the World Financial Center. And the police sees me at the door and they start screaming, don't look back, don't look back. Don't. And when they tell you don't look back, that's the first thing that you do. You turn around and you look back. And I turn around and I saw all the bodies of the people that jumped out of the building, which I didn't know they were doing that. And it was a horrible scene because you couldn't recognize the body parts. You know, you saw hair, you saw body mass, you saw uh, um, cloth, but you didn't know what was a leg, what was a head, you, you didn't know. And it was so horrible. And I started screaming and crying, God, what is this, what is this? And when I look down, what do I see? The body of that lady that I helped to escape from the 33rd floor, I found the only body that was recognizable was hers, but it was cut in half. It was like cut through here. And I started crying, of course, and and my speculation, again, it's speculation that she probably came out. I said, God, I saved myself, and a glass from the top of the building came down with such a force that cut her in half. And when I saw that, I said, oh, God, please, what is this? And I hear, run, 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 run. The police is running across the street. And all of a sudden, I feel the uh, floor shake like it was an earthquake. And when I look up, the building started to come down. 
And the only thing I saw was a fire truck. I went right under the fire truck and the village started to go pa, 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 right on top of me. And the only thing I said to, to myself was, God, please don't give my mother to see my body in parts. Let my mother find my, my whole body to be able to recognize it. Uh, because of the stuff that I saw that it was unrecognizable. And as I do that, I was like, you know, suffering for her, for what she had to go through. And I would say, this is going to be a, a slow death. And all of a sudden, there's a silence, and then this dust came with such a force that it burns your face, your body. If my shirt was broken into pieces, uh, uh, you can see pictures that was... Uh, uh, released 10 years after where you see me with a vest but no shirt because my shirt was destroyed and uh, I was like oh my god this is going to be slow but with the luck that across the street there were uh, 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 media people who said the last man out was on that area and that's how they started looking through the rubble I was trapped alive I passed from being a rescuer to be rescued and I remember that once they pulled me from under the rubble hours after, I I was in shock. Look, I couldn't find the towers. I was like 110 fly, floors of, uh, 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 of concrete and steel. And where's God? Where's it gone? And all I saw, this huge pile. And I was like, no, it cannot be, it cannot be, it cannot be. Anyway, they pulled me out, and uh, it, the dust was still there, didn't disperse. You know, it was there for hours and hours. And uh, I was, like, in shock. And the shocking thing was that when they pulled me out, I didn't break a bone. I was scratched, I was burned and everything, but I didn't break a single bone. So what did I do? I go running, I start looking again through the rubble. I started to do the process of rescuing more people. And I remember there was... Uh, a bridge that connected the the, the 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 World Trade Center to the World Financial Center. That bridge fell down, and fell down on top of uh, so, several trucks. And I went on the one truck, and I saw the legs of a fireman. I pulled the boots. I stayed with one boot with the leg inside, and and I started screaming, "Help! Help! Help!" We were able to get the man out uh, when I got help, and uh, uh, as we go to the ambulance, the guy died. Uh, and again, you can find photos. I'm going to give you the photos. You can see it right here. Uh, and it was uh, horrible. So I stayed there until until minutes before Building 7 uh, came down. I saw Building 7 falling down once I was put on a ferry uh, at the end of the day to, to be taken out of the area. And uh, then I came back the following day. I started uh, doing the bucket brigade. And uh, I found several body parts, and that drove me crazy. They took me out of the area. And uh, from that moment on, my life changed. My life was totally changed. Go ahead. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's incredibly important and impactful.